up your Bible to John chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to look at a few different scriptures today, so uh, but just keep your place in John 6 uh, later on. Alright, John 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus went over the, went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the, in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, filled twelve baskets with the, with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men when they had seen the sign that Jesus did said this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. What attracts people to Jesus? What is it that is so attractive to people that they would want to come to Jesus? Seeing Evidence. They want to see the evidence. They want to see that Jesus is who he said that he was and that he was doing the things that, that uh, his word says that he has done. Now, the best form of advertisement is word of mouth. If you ever went uh, to a, a store or business or a restaurant or any of those things, uh, if you have bad service, you're Word's going to get around that you have bad service. And if you have good service, good food, good merchandise, the word's going to get around that there's good things at this place. So word of mouth is the best form of advertisement. It doesn't matter what you see on TV. We can see a thousand commercials. If, if the commercials are advertising one thing and all your friends are saying, no, oh, that's not what they're advertising. Word of mouth is the best form. Now, we are not trying to sell Jesus to the lost people out here in the world. Uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, Jesus uh, it is not a commodity that we can buy or sell. He is a Lord that needs to be praised and glorified. Uh, but you know what? We can, we can talk all day long about Jesus. We can tell people everything that we know about Jesus. We can tell them all the wonderful things that he did. Uh, we can tell them how they need Jesus to be the Lord of the life in order for them to gain access to heaven for all eternity. We can tell them all of those things. But what the people really need is evidence. If we're not showing them what we're saying, then it's, if we're just like a business that advertises one thing but serves up something totally different. They need to see Christ living and working in us. Now, if I was to ask you, what is the greatest need in our world today? Y'all would probably come up and say, well, well, food. Food is the greatest need. We've got people all over the globe that are starving to death. We, we can hear stories. We can see pictures of little kids starving. They need food. Uh, the homeless that are out on the street, they need food. We can say that food is one of the greatest needs that this world has today. Or we might even say water. 
you know, you can go a little while without food, but you can't go very long without water. So maybe people need good, clean drinking water so that they can stay healthy. I know that's an issue down there in Honduras, and it's an issue all over the, the world in, in these other countries where they don't have their water filtered and cleansed and all this like we do here in the United States. So water might be the greatest need. Because after all, if you're drinking dirty, polluted water, you're gonna get sick and you're gonna die anyway. So we might say that water might be the greatest need. Or we might say that shelter is the greatest need. People need to be, uh, have a roof over their head to protect them from the elements uh, that are going all, all around all over the world. Now all of these are great needs. They're wonderful needs and needs that we can certainly help. Uh, I know I, I've just uh, mentioned today two things that we could do to help somebody in need with uh, a, a, a friend that needs some furniture and a church that, that needs help in securing a building for their place of worship. Uh, so those are, those are great things, great needs all around the world. But the, the greatest need is that people need the Lord and they need the evidence that Jesus is who he said he was. Uh, hold on to your place in John there and flip to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, when I'm talking about evidence, I'm, I'm saying that evidence is just faith in action. So if we can look at uh, Matthew 25, we're going to look at verses 31 through 46. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom God prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also, then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer to them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Evidence is faith in action. You see, our faith will initiate the work. Now we don't work so that we're saved. We're not saved by our works. We don't work in order to get into heaven. But because we have faith, it initiates our work. And if you'll remember from the scriptures that I read in John chapter six, uh, the disciples, they took the loaves of bread and they took the fish and, and even though they didn't understand what Jesus was doing, they took it on their faith and they went and they gave the food out and everybody was satisfied with everything that had taken place. Now, we can tell people all day long about Jesus, but seeing Jesus living in us is much better. 
if someone is hungry and we're able to help them, then help them. And I know we've got a great concern about these people that stand on the street corners holding up a sign, uh, homeless, hungry, will work for food. And, and I know a lot of you are concerned, and I'm concerned too, that uh, just handing them out some money out the window, uh, a lot of them uh, have, have some drug habits. And they're not really concerned about food. Uh, that's how they make their living, is off the kindness of people. There are a ton of them out there, and I've seen it. Uh, proven over and over again. They say, don't, don't help this person. That social media is used for good. They'll take a picture of them and say, if you see this person, don't help. I offered them a job making $15 an hour and they laughed at me and said, I make more than that doing this. So, I'm not talking about if you see somebody on the street corner, we'll work for food, please feed me, and you hand five. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you know somebody that's hungry, if somebody sp specifically asks you for food and you're able to help them, if you're in a restaurant, somebody comes up and says, I'm hungry, can you help me? You take them up to the counter and you order food for them and you can help them, then do it. That's the kind of help I'm talking about. I'm not talking about helping uh, people to keep their habits going or, or helping them to make a living off of somebody's kindness. If we're able to help people, our faith should initiate that work within us to do that kindness for that person. But the opposite of faith is the lack of work. If we say we have faith but we don't have work, then, and there's a whole lot of scriptures that will back that up, but that would indicate that our faith isn't real. Uh, so if you don't help somebody, when you're able to help somebody, then Jesus had some pretty strong words to say about that in action. Yeah, in, in Matthew, he said, depart into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil. That's pretty serious right there. Jesus talked more about hell than any other person in the Bible. Jesus talked about hell quite often. He talked about the torment. Why would he talk about all those things? Because he loves us and he doesn't want anybody to go there. So of course he's going to talk about the thing that he wants to keep us from. And he's saying if, if you're not doing these things, if you're not displaying love in a world that is cold and, and bitter, then I'm wondering where your heart is. We need to be about doing God's work. We need to help when we can. But you see, the people, all these 5,000 people, they came to Jesus because they saw the evidence in his life. They saw all the miracles that he did. Then they went, they sat down, they saw him miraculously feed 5,000 people with just a, a boy's lunch. They saw all the evidence that they needed to. And then Jesus asked Philip a rhetorical question. Where can we buy bread that these may eat? Now that's a question that he didn't want an answer to. He already knew ahead of time what he was going to do. He already knew every step that he was going to take. He already knew that the young boy had food and that he was going to use that to feed these people. But when he asked Philip that question, it was to teach him something. You see, those kinds of questions, they teach us what critical thinking is. We need to be thinking about an answer to the solution that we have. And Philip could not think like Jesus. He immediately went to the, to the money issue. Well, 200 denarii worth of bread isn't going to be able to feed all of these people. We've got a problem, Jesus. We don't have the resources to meet this need. It's not going to happen. But what Jesus wanted Philip to do is see his way of doing things. The miraculous way of doing things. But all he saw was, we just, we can't do this. We can't get it done. And I know in that letter, the church was saying, you know, we're asking for a big thing. But we're trusting that God... If he wants us to have a church in Flaherty, 
We're trusting that he's going to provide a way out. You see, that's going out by faith. Let's throw it out there and let's see if God can meet our need to help us. There is always, always an answer to our dilemma. And the answer is that we can't do anything on our own. There's no way Philip could have earned enough money to go out and buy bread. And there's no way he could have went into town and bought enough bread to feed 5,000 people. It was, it was impossible. We couldn't do it on our own. Philip couldn't do it on his own. Only Jesus could do it on his own. John chapter 15. Just a few pages up. John chapter 15, verse 5 through 8. And this is from our, our Bible study on Sunday nights of Follow Me. Verses 5 through 8 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You see, with Jesus, we work. If we got Jesus in our heart, then we'll work. We'll talk to people about Jesus. We'll have kindness in our heart. We'll love our neighbor. We'll, we'll help when we can. We'll do all of these things that Jesus would have us to do. We will produce. I know Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I alone can do nothing. If you were to ask me to pastor this church on my own, I would have failed two weeks into it, and y'all would have kicked me out and laughed at me, and that would have been the end of it. You wouldn't have had to hear about Brother Bobby anymore. But because I know that God can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, when y'all asked me to come here and pastor this church, I said, I can't do it, but I know somebody that can. And he's been doing it for a little while now. You see, a branch that is part of the vine will produce what it's supposed to do. What happens to a branch if it's not producing? It gets cut off. It gets separated because it's taken away from the nourishment of the rest of the vine. So if we are a Christian, we're going to do what God has uh, purposed us to do. We're going to produce. We're going to produce good works in this world so that people can see the evidence that Jesus Christ is real. And, and if we don't produce, if we don't remain in Christ, then we are like a dead branch that is cut off and thrown into the fire. I think that's pretty hardcore scripture there. If we're not doing what God wants us to do, then it's not going to be the way we want life to go. And our eternity is not going to be the way that we want it to go. Now, I don't preach these things uh, because I, uh, I want to. I, I preach them because I have to. You see, as a pastor, I'm held accountable. If I don't warn you all about the dangers of hell, then I'm held accountable for it. So I have to preach these things. I'm compelled to preach the tough scriptures because I, for one, don't want to see not only any of you that are here today uh, being sent to hell because you lack faith. I don't want to see anybody in this world sent to hell. Think of the person that, that, that you hate the most, that, that is the most ungodly, cruel, violent person in this world. I, I don't want to see them burn in hell. I would love to, for somebody to tell them about Jesus so that they can have a chance to repent and give their lives to Christ. I, I, I'm like God. I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to have everlasting life. So that's why I preach the tough things. But in those tough things, we still have hope. Does Jesus still perform miracles today? Yeah. Yeah. 
He sure does perform miracles today. Does he meet the needs of his people? Now, I'm not talking about wants. I'm talking about needs. You see, we all have wants. We all have desires. But Jesus will meet our need every single time. Our wants are not necessarily what God's will is for our lives. And you know what? When, when we talk to God, when we ask God for something and, and He doesn't deliver, sometimes we can get discouraged. God, I, I want you to do this. And, and when he says no, we can get discouraged. Uh, I know I'm, I'm just like you all. I, mean, I can get discouraged real easy when, when maybe I don't see things the, the way I want them to be. But I know that God is still working in all things for the good of those that love him. Y'all have all heard my testimony. Or maybe you, you know part of it. Or if you haven't, I'd be more than happy to share it with you. But you've all heard my testimony about the time in 1999 in my life when me and Gina's marriage was crumbling. And, and my mom uh, was in the hospital. And I was able to go to her uh, a few days before she passed away. And, and, and she had a moment where she was conscious, whether they didn't have her knocked out. And I looked at her and I could see my life crumbling all around me. Everything was failing in my life. I said, Mom, you can't go. I need you. She looked at me and went, I can't do nothing about it. You see, we all want our loved ones to live forever with us. We don't ever want to lose anybody. But we can't get to heaven unless we die. And there's something in my testimony that God was showing me. Now sometimes he'll heal somebody, he'll ask for prayers and he'll miraculously heal them and take away their cancer. And sometimes he doesn't or, or Whatever it is, sometimes God does those things, sometimes he doesn't. But the thing that he taught me in my mom's death was that I needed him more than I needed my mom. You see, when the Lord took my mom away from me, it propelled me. It commanded me into the Lord's presence and into the Lord's service. It taught me to seek answers to the questions of life. Why are we here? Is all this for nothing? Did I just say goodbye to my mom and that's the last time I'm going to see her and all this life is about nothing? No, it compelled me to look to the scriptures and to read them and to find truth and to find the Lord and to invite him into my heart and then to begin serving him and trying to teach others. To love the Lord with all your heart, to love your neighbor, and to get out there and, and do all that God's that God His will wants you to do to do. You see, God will meet our needs. Sometimes we just don't know what we need. I needed Jesus so desperately. God knew it. And maybe that's why He, he took my mom in the time that I desperately needed her. Sometimes we have to think about what God wants and not what we want. What God knows we need and not what we think we need. But the people in, in our scripture today, they, they went out and they were searching for Jesus. Afterwards, look at, at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. I would encourage you after today's sermon to read all of chapter 6 so you can get a full understanding of everything that Jesus was doing. But in verse 22 through 27, 
It says, On the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, they saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. You see, the people were chasing after Jesus so that he would feed them again, that he would give them some earthly food that they needed. Jesus said, that's the wrong reason to come to me. The reason that you come to me is because you want life. You want everlasting life. You don't come to me just to, so I can I can be your genie and whatever you wish, whatever you wish, whatever you wish. You come to Jesus for life, and we must have that life in us, or we're never going to enter into His presence in heaven. God wants our focus on Him, not on this world. You see, we need to be about chasing after the things that God wants in our lives, not what we want. From our study on Sunday night, uh, John chapter 15, verse 16, which is going to say the same thing that verse 7 uh, said in, in chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. That your fruit should remain, but whatever that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. David Platt broke this down and he made it extremely easy. He said the key to our prayer lives is this. Make your wants what God wants. And then you can simply ask for whatever you want, God will grant your request. You see, if our wants, if, if our prayer concerns are what God wants, then we ask Him for it, then He's going to give it to us. It's that simple. So let me ask you, what is your need today? Is it a want or is it a need? If it's a need, I guarantee you, I guarantee you God's going to need it. If it's a want, he may or may not. I know there's a lot of things in this world I want, but I know God will meet my needs. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, sometimes your word is, is mighty tough on us, and it makes us take a look at our inward to ourselves. Father, I don't know what's in anybody's heart. I can only tell you, and you already know what's in my heart. Father, I know everyone's heart here. They're here for a reason. They're, they're seeking truth. And God, we ask that you help us to find the truth. Father, I, I give this invitation time to you. I pray that you work on hearts. Work on my heart, work on everyone's heart here. That we are always about your will. And Father, help us to lay down our will. Father, I was reading in your word, and you just reminded me. Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. And Father, what you showed me when I read that was not that I'm willing to die for my friends, but that I'm willing to die to myself. 
that I would be there to help my friends find you. Father, may we all be like that. May we care enough about our friends, our family, our loved ones that you would help us to help them find you. Father, we love you and we praise you and give this time to you in Jesus' name.